Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Caldwell Evans. become 
plant-based. And in 1951, in England's leading medical journal, Drs. Strom and Janssen looked up the death rates from heart attack and stroke in Norway surrounding this time period. Let's look at this together. Here we are on the left. We have a pointer? Okay. All right. We'll do it manually. <laughs> Anybody got a stick? <laughs> Starting here on the left, 1927, Norway. Deaths from heart attack and stroke going up. 1930, going up. 35, going up. 1939, income to Germans. 1940, whoop, 41, whoop. Who oh, knew these Germans were these great public health educators? <laughs> but look what happened in 1945 with the death of Adolf Hitler the cessation of hostilities in the European theater. Immediately, back comes the meat, back comes the dairy, back come the strokes, back come the heart attacks. Pretty profound stuff. However, we didn't get it. Okay. Now the next four or five slides will be the most important message that I have for you today. What you're looking at now, on the left, excuse me, on your right, this is a nasty, nasty artery filled with a lot of plaque. And you're probably saying, what happens when that little remaining opening closes? Will there be a heart attack? Only about 10% of heart attacks come from something that nasty. That's going to cause you some angina, chest pain, shortness of breath, heart attack, 10%. Now I'm going to show you in a few minutes how 90% of heart attacks occur. But first, all those, <clears throat> even those of you in the back, this is a normal artery. There's a tiny little dark line, the innermost layer of the artery. It's called the endothelium. There are going to be two very important words, three words, that I want you to retain from this presentation. One is the endothelium, and the other is nitric oxide. All experts in this disease would agree that where this disease has its inception, its onset, its beginning, is when we progressively injure the life jacket and the guardian of our blood vessel, that delicate innermost lining, the endothelium. And what makes that endothelium so magical is that it produces a molecule that protects all of our vasculature, providing there's enough of that molecule and you haven't injured your endothelial capacity to make it. All right. Now, <clears throat> when you eat the milkshake and the cheeseburger mm -hmm. and the pizza, the first thing that happens is all these cellular elements begin to get sticky, sticky, sticky. Your endothelium gets sticky, your white cells get sticky, your cholesterol gets sticky. Now, <clears throat> I know you've all been waiting for this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this, even though I went to Yale, mm. this is a slide of Peter Libby from Harvard. Okay. <laughs> and where I cannot reach, up there in the blue, is where the blood is circulating. And then, right about here, those little purple cells which separate the flowing blood from the artery wall, the endothelium. Okay. 
Now, <clears throat> to make sense out of this, let's start together in the upper left. Way up there in the upper left, those are orange, small. Your LDL, your bad cholesterol. But they're sticky. So they bump up against your sticky endothelium, which you injure, and find a crack, a fissure, an opening, and now your bad cholesterol is in the sub <coughs> endothelial space. And there it suddenly gets oxidized, which is why it now becomes no longer orange, but from here on, Peter Libby has painted it yellow. Because your small, hard, dense LDL cholesterol is sort of nasty. The subendothelial space doesn't like it. Calls upon the SWAT team, mm -hmm. our white blood cells. Our white blood cells, which Peter Libby from Harvard here, is painted blue in honor of Yale. We like that. <laughs> but the SWAT team in the subendothelial space begins to gobble up, gobble up, gobble up all these small, hard, dense LDL cholesterol particles. So suddenly now we're all the way over here to the right side. And now, once that macrophage is so packed full of all these small, hard, dense LDL cholesterol particles, we in medicine do what we do so often. We change the name. And now it's called the foam cell. And remember this. The foam cell is the Darth Vader of this entire sequence of events. Why? Because the foam cell progressively erodes the cap over this plaque. This plaque is blocking the artery by 35%. You don't begin to get symptoms to your 75% block. This probably represents 70% of the people in Winnipeg. Okay? Not a problem. However, when that foam cell and those nasty, nasty enzymes that the foam cell produces called uh, metamotaloproteinases, you want the names? Stromelosin, elastase, collagenase, myeloperoxidase. What do they do? It's so bad. They progressively take this innocuous little plaque and erode the cap. So the cap gets thinner and thinner and thinner until finally the sheer force of blood <laughs> racing over it, tears it. And now you have that <clears throat> seminal moment where what has happened what has happened in that seminal moment is you have ruptured the cap over the plaque. Once you have ruptured the cap over the plaque, you now have extravasation, or the oozing out of, if you will, of plant content out into the flowing blood, which activates our clotting factors and platelets. And so now, in a matter of minutes, after you've ruptured your plaque, that clot begins to form. And the clot is, in and of itself, self-propagating. So in a matter of further minutes, bingo, suddenly, the entire artery is now blocked. There is no time for collateral blood supply to develop. And all the downstream heart muscle below this block dies. That is your heart attack, 90%. If I do my job correctly today, every one of you and your friends and your relatives should be able to make themselves Heart attack proof. Okay. How are you going to do that? Or you're not going to do it with a drug or a pill. You're not going to do it with a procedure. You're not going to do it with an operation. How are you going to do it? You're going to do it <laughs> by changing your biochemistry. How are you going to change your biochemistry? By changing your food to plant-based nutrition. And we'll see how that's done. Now, just because you thought I was through with the endothelial cell, I'm not. <laughs> Here, forget the x-ray. Here's the art artist drawing this artery with half of it filled with plaque. 
and you can see the endothelial cells here. Now, it was up until 1980 that we used to think of the endothelial cells as simply those cute little red bricks that were lining our pipes. In 1980, that all changed. Why? What happened? In 1980, Dr. Fershkot, working in Brooklyn, was taking the largest blood vessel in the rodent, the aorta, and he would do this sort of elliptical spiral staircase cut on it right through the endothelium. Then he would immerse it in a bath of saline, and it would constrict. But one day, no cut, no injury to the endothelium. Immersed it, dilated. Did it again, dilated. Now the race was on globally. What was the E, D, R, F that Dr. Fershkot had discovered? Endothelial derived relaxation factor. Rolls right off your tongue. <laughs> Thank heavens that term was only with us eight years. In 1988, Dr. Fershkot, Louis Merrill, and Dr. Murat discovered that that EDRF was a gas, nitric oxide. And for that, those three men got the Nobel Prize in 1998. Now what makes nitric oxide so absolutely magical are its functions. One, nitric oxide will keep all the cellular elements in our bloodstream flowing smoothly like Teflon rather than Velcro. Keeps things from getting sticky. Number two, nitric oxide is the strongest blood vessel dilator in the body. When you climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, the arteries to your legs, they widen, they dilate nitric oxide. Number three, key, is <clears throat> nitric oxide will keep the wall of your artery from becoming thickened, stiff, or inflamed, protect you from getting high blood pressure, hypertension. Number four, absolute key, the key, number four, number four, <laughs> a safe and normal amount of nitric oxide will protect you from ever developing. Blockages are black. So literally everybody on the planet, whether they're from London, Berlin, Montreal, New York, Winnipeg, <laughs> if there is cardiovascular disease, it is because by now, that individual, because in the preceding decades, has so sufficiently trashed, injured, and train wrecked their endothelial function. It no longer is making enough nitric oxide to protect them from making blockages and plaque. But the good news is this. This is not a malignancy. This is not your genes. This is not your stress. This is completely benign, full-blown illness. exciting thing is that when you can persuade these patients never again to have anything past their lips that is going to further injure an already train wrecked endothelium. The endothelium recovers, makes enough nitric oxide so that the disease can be halted, and often we see significant elements of disease reversal. Pretty exciting stuff. Last two functions of nitric oxide. One <clears throat> is it will keep the smooth muscle of the artery wall from migrating into the plaque. And number six, number six, nitric oxide can absolutely destroy the foam cell. Dr. Baker, okay. Pretty exciting stuff. Now, if 
probably saying, as I look out at this group, this intelligent audience is saying to themselves, gosh, I wonder what my level of nitric oxide is. <laughs> okay, here's what you do. You want to know what your level of nitric oxide is. It's really not available yet at the doctor's office, but here's how they do it in a research setting. You take an, an ultrasound probe and place it over your brachial artery at the elbow, and there on the screen is the readout. There's the diameter of your artery, okay? And for five minutes, you encircle the upper arm with a blood pressure cuff and pump it up above systolic blood pressure so that for five minutes, five minutes, you have absolutely zero blood flow to your forearm and hand. Now, uh, <clears throat> I've had that done. It's not exactly habit forming. <laughs> but that's what Dr. Vogel did when he took, he was uh, chairman of cardiology at University of Maryland. He took a group of healthy young subjects to a certain fast food restaurant characterized by arches which are gold. <laughs> And half of the group had cornflakes, the other half had hash browns and sausage. After the group had the cornflakes, the brachial artery tourniquet test, wrong. The group that had the hash browns and sausage within 140 minutes, they couldn't dilate the artery. That single meal of hash browns and sausage had so destroyed the capacity of their endothelial cells to make nitric oxide, they didn't have enough to dilate the artery. But, being young, they followed them into the late afternoon, early evening, began to recover. But, you and I know that the next morning for breakfast is going to be <laughs> scrambled eggs and bacon. <laughs> Lunchtime, we'll have some white bread with cold cuts and mayonnaise. Supper time, how about a baked potato with sour cream? Uh, Lamb chops, vegetables soaked in butter, and ranch dressing on the salad, and ice cream. Here in the good old U.S. and Canada, we just take those endothelial cells starting as kids, and meal after meal after meal, we pound them, we injure them, so that by the time we get through high school, we've already got the disease, and no surprise, Several decades later, we now begin to see that clinical cardiac events are in fact and stroke. All right. Now, this is just again a summary of the features of nitric oxide. I can't say this enough. You've got to know what the endothelial cells do, and you've got to know how you injure your endothelial cells. So that obviously we what you're going to see the rest of this presentation is what we do aggressively with patients who come to me who do have cardiovascular disease because uh, they learn fairly rapidly that I can be at times a bit of a taskmaster, but I've been told that I'm not as mean as I look. So, uh, all right, because the goal here is not to have a second stent, a third stent, a fourth or fifth stent, and then a bypass. That's not the goal. The goal is to absolutely annihilate this completely benign foodborne illness. Okay. Now, we really only have time today. Of these wonderful defense factors that we all have, I'm talking about the endothelial cell. But believe it or not, all these others which would take us into midnight, forget it. Because every single one of these is going to be optimized when you're eating whole food, plant-based nutrition. With apologies to all those who've been using it all day long, I didn't say vegan. I said whole food, plant-based nutrition. I treat vegans all the time for heart disease. Vegans eat oil. Vegans eat french fries. Vegans eat glazed donuts. <laughs> All right. I want to share with you now two studies that I got involved in. Uh, the first was 
when I was halfway through my surgical career. Why in the world, I mean, if you'd, <laughs> if you'd asked me when I was in medical school or when I chose to be a surgeon, that halfway through my career I'd be inspired to get interested in nutrition, I'd have laughed at you. But halfway through my career I did. And the reason was, I was at that point, I was chairman of our breast cancer task force. And what really disillusioned me was the fact that for no matter how many women I was doing breast surgery, I was doing absolutely nothing for the next unsuspecting victim. And uh, that led to a bit of global research. It was quite striking to find that there were uh, women in cultures where breast cancer rates were 30 or 40 times less frequent in the United States. If you looked at breast cancer in Japan in the 1950s, in rural Japan, it was very infrequently identified. And yet, as soon as the Japanese women would migrate to the United States for the second and third generation, still pure Japanese American, they now had the same rate of breast cancer as their Caucasian counterpart. And even more powerful was perhaps cancer of the prostate. In the entire nation of Japan in 1958, how many autopsy proven deaths were there from cancer of the prostate? 18, entire nation. The most mind-boggling public, public health figure I think I've ever heard. However, at that point, it began to look to me like there would be much more bang for the buck if we could look at the leading killer of women and men in Western civilization, which was cardiovascular disease. So the idea was that since I was running into these cultures where cardiovascular disease was virtually non-existent, and if we therefore could get people to eat to save their heart, they would also maximize the likelihood of saving themselves from the common Western cancers of breast, prostate, colon, and pancreatic. Okay. All right. Now, so this was a small study. I was still actively involved with my surgical obligations, but I had nothing against women. This is just the way that patients were sent to me when I told the Department of Cardiology I wanted to do this study taking patients who were seriously ill with cardiovascular disease, see if I could get them to eat plant-based, and maybe we could change the course of their disease. Now, these were, as plants eat, my late brother-in-law used to say, these are essays walking today. They had failed their first or second bypass, they had failed their first or second angioplasty, they were too sick for these procedures, so they had refused five of those, and were told they wouldn't live out a year. I'm happy to say that they all made it beyond 20 years, and it was really quite a strike, striking to see the results that we were getting. Now the key was this. I didn't want them to eat one morsel that would injure their endothelial cells. So what do we avoid? Yeah. Any drop of any oil. Olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, palm oil, oil on a cracker, oil on a piece of bread, oil on a salad dressing. Uh, oil injures the endothelial cells. And just in case you don't believe me, this is one of multiple peer-reviewed scientific studies showing how olive, soybean, and palm oil intake have a similar acute detrimental effect over the endothelial function in healthy young subjects. This is the work of Stanley Hazen, and this shall tells us one of the reasons why animal protein is so bad. For persons who are omnivores, who are eating animal foods, they are eating less than molecules of lecithin and carnitine, which are found in these animal products that you see listed here. Omnivores who eat these products possess in their gut, in their microbiome, they possess bacteria which, when they metabolize the less than the carnitine seen in these animal products, they get metabolized to a molecule called TMA, trimethylamine. And trimethylamine is rapidly converted by your liver to trimethylamine oxide and trimethylamine oxide injures your blood vessels, okay? So now we've got the olive that injures the olive oil and other oils that injure it, plus we've got animal products. Here's the mechanism of how that happens. You start over here on the left with 
less than in quarantine, found in these animal foods that you're eating. And my, your microbiome makes TMAO, and that injures the vascular system. So what are you going to eat? You're going to eat all these marvelous whole grains for your cereal, bread, pasta, and rolls, and 101 different types of legumes, beans, and lentils, all those wonderful red, yellow, green leafy vegetables, and some fruit. And there are hundreds of recipes in my book, the one by my wife and my daughter, by John McDougall, by Neil Barnard, and others. So there's going to be hundreds of, hundreds of delicious recipes for you. Now, <clears throat> one thing that we've added in the last six and a half, seven years, it's not in my book, but it's so powerful. This is for patients who do have heart disease. I asked them to imagine that they could shrink their head to a size that it could crawl into that artery, to their heart, that is diseased. And they would see that that plaque is an absolute cauldron of oxidative inflammation. So we need antioxidants. No, don't go down to the health food store and buy a jug of pills that says antioxidant because it doesn't work and it's going to be harmful. Therefore, you are going to get your antioxidants from food. Fair enough. What food? Food that is high in what we call ORAC value. O-R-A-C, oxygen radical absorptive capacity. Now that means if you're having raspberries, blueberries, strawberries, and blackberries on your morning oat cereal, that's terrific. However, nothing, nothing, nothing can trump the antioxidant value of green leafy vegetables. So I need these patients of mine to chew, not smoothies, not juicy. I need them to chew a green leafy vegetable uh, six times a day that has been first boiled in water five and a half to six minutes or steam so it's nice and tender. Then you must, you must then anoint it with several drops of a delightful balsamic vinegar. Why? Because the acetic acid in the vinegar has been shown to restore the nitric oxide synthase enzyme contained within the endothelial cell that is responsible for making nitric oxide. And also, that's helping the endothelial cell. But the green does something else. Remember, by this time, I'm desperate for those patients to safely get more nitric oxide. But the green does something else. When you chew that green in your mouth, it is going to interact, not smoothies, but while you're chewing it, it's going to interact with the uh, and a facultative, <coughs> facultative anaerobic bacteria that reside in the crypts and grooves of your tongue. And those bacteria will reduce the nitrate that you're chewing to a nitrite. When you swallow the nitrite, your gastric acid further reduces it to nitric oxide, which can now enter the nitric oxide pool. Okay. Well, that was kind of fun. <laughs> no what? <laughs> now let's do this. What you're going to see today, right now, is something that most of the physicians who are going to be talking with you or your cardiologist has not seen. They can see it if they read my book. They can see it if they read our scientific papers. But I find most physicians haven't done that yet. What are you going to see here? These are some angiograms that we took of the group. And these were all reviewed in triplicate in the Cleveland Clinic Angiography Core Laboratory. So when I give you a percent of reversal, I know that it's accurate. This is the left anterior descending coronary artery, the Widowmaker. On the left, in a 67-year-old retired uh, pediatrician. And this, this, the slight improvement there is 10%, which is as small as you can see with your eye. This is easier 
In a 58-year-old factory worker, the circumflex artery to the back of the heart, this was described as a 20% improvement from the left to the right. And this next one is in a 54-year-old security guard, the right coronary artery. This was described as a 30% improvement from left to right. Now, this is a colleague of mine, Sir Joe Crow, 1996. He replaced me as chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force. At age 44, in 1996, he began getting chest pain. Cardiology worked him up. He was not hypertensive. Uh, he was not diabetic. He was not a smoker. He didn't have a high cholesterol. He didn't have a strong family history. Chest pain. So cardiology worked him up in uh, October of 1996. We find out. A month later, he finished his surgical schedule, sat down, writing post-operative orders. Boom! The elbow was on his chest, searing pain in his jaw, shoulder, left arm, having a heart attack, whipped down to the cath lab, start the catheterization, cardiac arrest, resuscitate, finish the catheterization. One more cardiac arrest, stabilized, sent to his room, Three days later, discharged, but very depressed. Why was he so depressed? He was depressed because at the time of his angiogram, the well maker, that entire lower one third was all moth eaten and diseased over too long a second to just simply ram in stent after stent after stent. And it was too far down the artery for a bypass. So poor Joe just didn't think they could do anything for him and he was depressed. So Anna and I, Anna and I had him out to the house for supper two weeks after his heart attack with his wife. Joe, come on. You've been eating this horrible Western diet and you've got this typical Western disease. We've got 10 years of data. Why don't you think about going plant-based? Okay, yes, I'll give it a shot. But I'm not taking any of those statin drugs. I don't trust them. Fine, that's your call, not a problem. He became the absolute personification of commitment to whole food plant-based nutrition. Over the next two and a half years, his total cholesterol plummeted, his LDL went from 98 down to 38, and then he had another angiogram. Now, at noontime, because our offices were in the same area of the building, at noontime I found myself going over uh, and on the day that he had his follow-up angiogram in the morning, and I let myself in his office there, he was sitting behind his desk, Joe. I understand you had the old follow-up angiogram earlier this morning. Mind uh, sharing with me? Uh, how'd he go? He got up from his desk, came around, put his arms around me, a couple of these. <laughs> and he said, you know, I think we're doing okay. Would there be any chance that I could see the, the, <laughs> the angiogram? He said, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, this isn't going to happen to everybody. But when the plaque is young and soft and made up of inflammation, fat, and cholesterol, the capacity of the body to reverse this is pretty profound. But when the plaque has been there for decades and is made up of scar, fibrosis, calcification, it's like a piece of concrete, it's not going to go away. But it is my job today in Winnipeg to make sure that you understand even those patients are going to be able to return to full activity without restriction. And it's my job to share that with you before we wrap this up. Okay. Now, also in that study, I wanted to know how many cardiac events from worsening disease were there in these patients, the 18 that stayed with us the whole time, 12 years, how many of these patients had had worsening cardiac events in the eight years prior to coming into our study while they were in the hands of expert cardiologists? They had these 49 events. 
of worsening disease, as you see categorized on this slide. Once they came into our program over the next 12 years, 17 of those 18 had no further events. But we did have one little sheep, after six years, wandered from the flock. <laughs> Got into the lamb shops, french fries, glazed donuts. Why in China? It's a bypass, but now he's back with the flock. It proves the point that I'm trying to share with you uh, today. Well, now, as excited as I was about that study, not all the other physicians were that excited. <laughs> it wasn't a large study. It wasn't prospectively randomized. And the doctor said, Dr. Esselstyn, your diet is pretty extreme. And by the way, I will share with you that our nutrition is significantly changed. But it is no different than that being consumed by half the planet that never has this disease. And I think that right now, if you want to talk about the most severe, extreme diet on the planet, it is the one consumed by those below the border and above the border that guarantees so many of our population will crumble from a chronic illness that they need never have. So, we did another study. Not 18, 200, okay? Two laws to follow up, 198. How do you know that you could get them to follow? Well, we looked that up. 89.3% were adherent close to four years. Now, how do you get patients to get adherence? Because we've had a number of cardiologists who say, damn it, I really believe the results you're getting. But S, how do you do this? I can't get my patients to do this. Well, to do that, make this happen, you've got to show a patient respect. The only way that I know to show a patient respect is to give them my time. If you think for one minute that a 12 or 15 minute office visit is going to get patients to change their lifestyle, you have been smoking something bad. <laughs> Not going to happen. So once a month, I have an intensive counseling seminar for patients, most of which I only will see one time because they're coming from throughout Canada, they're coming throughout the United States and from overseas. They can't come back every week. Our program is for six hours. They're gonna learn all about how they have created their disease in science that they can get their arms around, the endothelial cells and nitric oxide, right? They will understand how they created their disease and they will understand how we are empowering them as the locus of control to halt and to reverse the disease that they created. Okay. Now, <clears throat> also, since I'm a little old-fashioned and compulsive, I guess, two weeks before our seminar, my secretary would give me a list and with their phone numbers. And I personally insist on calling every one of these 14 to 16 patients, almost always with their spouse on the line as well, because I want to know I want to get my arms around their story. And at the same time, have them ask questions of me so that we have an opportunity to establish a foundation before they come to the seminar. And think about it. You've already learned today what I'm going to teach them at the seminar. And how many of you here who have ever had a cardiovascular event or a diagnosis of cardiovascular disease who by now understand that the only reason you have your disease is because you have so sufficiently trashed your endothelium with those foods, you don't have enough nitric oxide to protect yourself. Who in the heck is going to leave here and say, oh, God, that was interesting, but God, I can't wait to destroy some more endothelium. So I really, really enjoyed that first heart attack. The nurses were terrific. Pretty exciting stuff. You know, somebody said, well, God, what am I going to do when I go out to eat? Wait a minute. There are four reasons to go out to eat, right? One, you don't have to do the cooking. Two, you don't have to do the dishes. Three, the ambulance. Four, the companionship. But you never, ever go out to eat to further destroy endothelial cells, right? 
Now, it gets a little more complicated when you're asked to somebody's house, but they're having a buffet, a lot of guests. You march right through the old line, barring on those foods that are going to destroy you. Play with it. Don't touch it. Eat when you get home or before you run. It's a little dicey when the group is smaller. You're one of them. You and your husband. Or your husband and your wife. You're going to go to this. You're Bill and Ruth, your best friends for 30 years. Small sit down there, four people. Oh, now you've got to really use your interpersonal skills. <laughs> You know, you say, Ruth, Harriet and I have just enjoyed you and Bill all these years, but right now, I am being cared for by this absolute monster from Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> It'll work. <laughs> all right. Now, some things interesting. How do you know these patients were sick? Up at the top line, patient of intervention, 119 of those 177 had already had a bypass or a stent. But the thing that we're really excited about now, the second line down, patients avoiding intervention. We're now at a point where literally anybody who's in the middle of having a heart attack, a stent or a bypass can be absolutely life-saving. However, when these procedures are offered electively, there is no prolongation of life and no protection from a future heart attack. So we feel very aggressive. I'm one of the frequent phone calls that I get. Dr. Esselstyn, I, had an, I was having some chest pain, I was having an angiogram, and they found some blockages. They don't think it's good for a stent. I don't want to have the bypass. What are you going to do about it? Well, I said, look, the decision obviously is yours but I will share with you what our results have been. And for those patients who simply don't want to have their elective, elective from bypass, they don't have to have it. Because we are aggressively helping men treat the causation of their illness. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Now here, the results. In our patients who were adhering, one patient had a small stroke while he was misbehaving in China. The patients. 21 who were not in here, 62% of them had further cardiac events. And here is a bar graph that I think sets it up another way. Over here on the left, you can see major cardiac events, heart attack, stroke, and death. Here we have the Mediterranean diet. At four years, 25% heart attack, stroke, and death. Columbia Presbyterian Hospital out of New York City, natural history of cardiac disease, four years, 20% heart attack, stroke, and death. Bill Bowden's garage study, 19%. So somewhere around 22, 23% uh, failure rate with heart attack, stroke, and death. Here we are, treat the cause. Over a 30-fold difference. What makes ours so different? We are asking the patients to treat the causation of the illness. Ever since the days of Hippocrates, there's been a basic covenant of trust that whenever possible, the caregiver will share with the patient what is the causation of their illness. Sadly, today in cardiovascular medicine, that's not being done. It's not because cardiovascular colleagues for whom I have the greatest respect for their care, their compassion, and their fund of knowledge. How much nutrition training did they get in medical school or in their postgraduate cardiology training? Really, next to zero. Very meager. And I was proud to get invited three years ago by the American College of Cardiology to join and become a member of their nutrition committee. This is run by a wonderful physician from Denver, Andrew Freeman. And there are now close to 50 members on that committee, all of which are trying to have the cardiovascular community become aware of the power of whole food, plant-based nutrition. All right. Now, yeah, this is also July of 2014, the second study that we published. Not 200 patients, three patients. Why? What are you doing publishing three patients? All three of these represent 
the absolute calamity of present cardiovascular medicine approach. Uh, the first is a gentleman from Canada. I've never met him eye to eye, but I got a letter from Bob Mercer, and I'll show you his story briefly. At age 44, complete blockage of his right carotid artery. Stroke, mild, recovered fully, but he had such severe angina, they found a courageous surgeon in, in Toronto who would operate on him despite the fact he had one totally blocked artery to his brain. And he did well. So he was now 69 years of age. And at this point, he had diabetes, horrible chest pain again, erectile dysfunction, and his one remaining carotid artery was now 90% blocked. And he thought this was going to be the end of it. And all things to have happened. His daughter, at age 30, 37, then had a heart attack. During her convalescence, she found a book. <laughs> Prevent reverse heart disease. And she said, Pop, we got to do this together. They did. A year later, I got a letter from Bob Mercer. Dr. Esselstyn, I wanted to thank you. I've lost 40 pounds. I am no longer diabetic. I no longer have erectile dysfunction. All my angina has disappeared, and my one remaining carotid artery, which was 90% blocked, is now 67% blocked. And here is Bob, the picture he sent me uh, before and after Newfoundland. They even had green, green grass in Newfoundland. <laughs> All right. Now the next fellow comes from Cleveland, Ohio. Parma, Art Soteros. At age 32, Art, overweight, became diabetic. At age 42, Art, overweight, had his first of 14 stents at the Cleveland Clinic. Then he was told, these aren't working for you. You better get a bypass. That was great for 18 months. And then it failed. And then he was told, you know, these aren't working for you. You'll just have to see what happens on drugs. A fellow parishioner found our program. He came, he was wonderfully compliant. He lost 40 pounds. He lost all of his diabetes. He lost all of his angina. And he regularly comes to our seminar to present his story to those who are in attendance. And there is our before and after. And he's since gotten married. Now, the last was Jim McNamara. Jim, age 55, partially blocked carotid, stroke. So they said, we better operate on that. Well, they did, and it totally failed. It wasn't open, the artery was closed, he was living on the one on the left. And he had get these pains in his leg. He got so severe, he couldn't put his leg up to sleep at night. He had such poor circulation. First operation on his leg, failed. Second one, failed. Third one, failed. And his wife found out about our program. He came, he was wonderfully compliant. That was five years, five and a half years ago. And now he can walk absolutely nonstop. And here he is on the left before, on the right, dancing with his daughter at her wedding. So let's compare the diet with a typical cardiovascular approach. There's no more mortality with the diet, there's no morbidity, there's no extra expense. The benefits improve with time, and when you think about it, the average patient who has had a heart attack is right now walking around with a sword of Damocles hanging over his or her head. When do I get my next heart attack? When was my shoe going to fall? Nonsense! You never have to have another heart attack. You live and behave in a way that you make yourself heart attack proof. Now, look, we've talked about the heart, but what good is it? to have a strong heart if your brain doesn't do it, all right? We know that by age 85 in Sweden and the United States, 50% of adults will have had dementia. It's not a great gift for a lifetime of hard work. So we got a lot of insight into this from Megan Leary and her team, who in 2001, reporting at the stroke meetings in Miami, had looked at over 5,500 MRIs of the brains of Americans. And what do they begin to see at age 50? They begin to see these tiny little white spots. What are they? 
little strokes. But you know, age 50, big brain, tiny stroke, not a problem. But suddenly you're no longer 50. You've had 15 more years of the good old American diet. You're 65. And more often than before, you find yourself saying, sweetheart, where did I leave the car keys? Do you know about that? But suddenly, it's 10 more years of the good old America. You're 75. You look at her and you say, sweetheart, where did I leave the car? <laughs> Somehow you get through that OK. Bingo, 10 more years have gone by. You're 85. You look at her and you say, are you my sweetheart? <laughs> I can't reverse that. You don't suddenly wake up on your 85th birthday with dementia. You work hard in all those preceding decades to lay the foundation for that dimension. Okay. Now here is a normal MRI. Here is one where I counted 90 of these little strokes. Can you imagine a message trying to go through all that scar tissue? Okay. Now here, on the left, look, the brain on the left is all the way out to the skull, but on the right, What's this here? The brain isn't all the way out to the skull. That's cerebral atrophy. You don't want cerebral atrophy as you get to be more senior. Right? What are you going to do about that? Exercise. If you're going to walk four or five times a week, fast enough so you're almost ready to break a sweat. Or you can bike or you can swim, uh, but you really want to get the pulse up a little bit. You can enlarge two points of the brain, the hippocampus, memory, frontal lobe, executive thinking. Now here, on the left, upper left, you see the thigh muscle of a 40-year-old triathlete. Upper right, thigh muscle, the 70-year-old couch potato. Lower right, thigh muscle of a 70 year old triathlete. The message is pretty clear. Now, on the left, you are looking at a pulse line. The pulse line of a patient when I first started our study, crossing the skyway to my office, he had to stop five times because of pain in his right calf, because he had a partially blocked artery in his right thigh. But I was so focused on his heart, I kind of forgot about his leg until 11 months later he said, Dr. Esselstyn, do you recall when I first started seeing you, I had to stop five times crossing the sky with your office because of pain in my right calf? Yeah. He said, you know, the last month, it got to be four times, three times, two times, one time. I don't stop anymore. The pain is gone. Done. Back you go to the vascular lab. Bingo. It was now double what we had earlier. We had absolutely now ab irrefutable, irrefutable, sound scientific evidence that food and food alone could reverse his cardiovascular disease in his leg. And you're going to say, well, wait a minute. What about the statin drug? Well, 1986, we didn't have any statin drugs. And I've talked to you about Dr. Crow, who reversed his heart disease, because, and he refused to take statins. And we have many patients who come to our program who simply cannot take a statin. They have such severe neuromuscular pain from it, or it's caused their liver a problem, or it's given them diabetes, or it's given them brain fog. They are in no way precluded from enjoying some of the benefits of providing if you would correctly. Yeah. And here, this is a 78-year-old retired high school chemistry teacher. And he and his wife, uh, in retirement, they love to enter square dance contests. Mm -hmm. But during the fast square dance, he was getting this bilateral calf pain. And the surgeons that he saw got these images that show how diseased the arteries were to his legs. He didn't like the idea of that big operation. And he came to see us 
and said, Dr. Esselstyn, if I choose your method, how long will it take me to get rid of my calf pain during those fast experiences? So I looked at him with great wisdom in my face. <laughs> I said, probably about 10 or 11 months. Three months later, I got a phone call. Dr. Esselstyn, you do not speak the truth. <laughs> the pain is gone. <laughs> All right. Now, I don't know what it's like in Canada, but in our town in Cleveland, if you're watching a sporting event, or if you're watching a mystery, just before the advertisement comes on, you will hear the mellifluous tones of the advertiser say something like, when the moment is right, will you be ready? <laughs> now, we all know that the penile, penile artery is really quite tiny compared to the coronary artery to the heart. So not infrequently, before somebody comes down with heart disease, they may find that they are no longer able to raise the flag. <laughs> but uh, all is not lost. Not infrequently, I'll get a phone call 10 or 11 months after I've counseled somebody, Dr. Esselstyn. Yes, this is Mr. So-and-so. Okay, sure enough. Yeah, he said, I really thought I ought to give you a call because recently something, thing, something has come up. <laughs> and I'm wondering if I don't owe you another check. <laughs> now, I promise you, before I wrap this up, that we could talk about how it is that when somebody has blockages in the vessels to the heart, and they still are going to get back to regular full activity without restriction. What you're looking at here is what we call a PET rabinium dichromal scan, translation, PET scan. All that happens is this. If the isotope gets in safely, there's good blood supply if it's orange or yellow. But here in this 60-year-old uh, stockbroker from downtown Cleveland, here it's green. That's poor. I counsel them here if the cholesterol was 248, 10 days later, his cholesterol was down to 137. I know that's not Canadian, I'm sorry, but it is. And then three weeks later, we repeated the PET scan, and also, it's all bad. Wait a minute. We didn't wash up. You don't, you don't get rid of a plaque with plant-based nutrition in three weeks. What's going on here? Well, here's what's going on here. That's the heart without a shred of muscle. It's outlined because of its incredible blood supply. Now the arteries that get all the publicity are the epicardial coronary arteries, the circumflex, the anterior descending, and the right coronary artery. When they ride on the surface of the heart, they're large, they're epicardial, they lend themselves to these stents and bypasses, okay? Where do they all go? They're, their goal is to the muscle. They all dive into the muscle. And you see thousands and thousands and thousands of these interdigitating vessels in the muscle. So I called Rodriguez. He is the cardiovascular pathologist at the Cleveland Clinic who dissects 200 hearts a year of those who are deceased. Rodriguez, how often do you ever see coronary artery disease in the coronary artery once it has now dived into the muscle? Never. Well, once in a very great while in a severe diabetic. Otherwise, never. So what's going on? Here's what's going on. When we initially see those patients, they are so beaten down by this Western diet they've been eating. Their endothelial output of nitric oxide, the dilate, is almost zero, very low. And when it's very low, the endothelium has become your enemy because it is now making two molecules that are 
vasoconstricted. Thromboxane and endothelin. Thromboxane and endothelin have locked up, have locked up that entire intramuscular cascade of thousands of vessels. They are pinched, they are narrowed. And the reason we often get rid of their angina, or less and less than within seven to 10 days, is because suddenly when you stop injuring the endothelial cell, you start to nurture it back to life. It stops making those vasoconstrictive molecules of thromboxane and endothelin. And it once again starts making nitric oxide. So you open up this mammoth entire cascade of intramuscular vessels is now open. And if you recall from physics, Poisset's law of flow through the hollow viscous is related to the fourth power of the radius. Translation, tiny increase in diameter, huge increase in flow. Kind of exciting. Now, here are the six ways, eight ways, to measure reversal of coronary artery disease. I've shown you the angiograms. The stress test also reverses. We've talked about the PET scan. We've talked about the carotid arteries being reversed. We've talked about pulse slime on the leg and the symptoms disappearing of angina, claudication, and erectile dysfunction. Pretty exciting stuff. Now, wrapping it up. For many years as a surgeon, I worked on the eighth floor of this hospital. But since you're not from Cleveland, I always think it's only fair that I sh show you what the trees looked like in Cleveland in February. <laughs> <laughs> However, now that I've retired from surgery and I find myself working at the Wellness Institute, the budget is a little bit more modest but the morale is really quite high. <laughs> and if there's one thing that I've learned in 57 years since leaving medical school, nothing, well, brains are important, without question. Nothing, nothing, nothing is as important, perhaps, as persistence, persistence, persistence. Best exemplified by this young damsel in 1939, Life magazine, trying and trying to learn how to do this place. And sure enough, the other day, downtown Winnipeg, Michelle found her and she got it right. <laughs> um, so, wrapping this up, what a delight and a treasure be in Winnipeg with you today and to have an opportunity to share some of my research and clinical strategies with you. The reason I find myself at 18 years since retiring from surgery so uh, passionate about medicine, perhaps even more so than I even was when I was a surgeon, is that we in medicine really are on the cusp of a seismic revolution in health. And the seismic revolution in health, I've talked to you today about cardiovascular disease. However, cardiovascular disease isn't the only disease that is vanquished by this type of approach. This is the most powerful tool that medicine has had in its toolbox, literally in a century. Because not only does it get rid of heart disease and strokes right, and vascular dementia, uh, hypertension, diabetes type 2, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, multiple sclerosis, allergies, asthma, and the list goes on and on. But this will only happen when we in the profession have the will and the grit and the determination to share with the public what is the lifestyle, and most specifically, what is the nutritional literacy that will empower them as the locus of control to absolutely annihilate chronic illness? Thank you.